Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the broad autism phenotype today, which is a topic that I had not researched in the least before coming to UT Dallas, um, but has increasingly become uh, a focus of my laboratory. So today I'm going to summarize a couple of uh, recent studies we've completed and talk to you a little bit about current studies in the lab, lab on this topic. Um, most of you guys in this room are familiar with autism. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I want you to uh, realize <coughs> that this concept of the broad autism phenotype which very briefly speaks to subclinical levels of autism, uh, mild symptoms of autism that don't meet the threshold for uh, clinical diagnosis. That concept has been discussed clinically since Leo Connor first described autism. So his first paper in 1943, the famous paper in which he uh, covered a series of 11 case studies, he described autism as a disturbance of effective contact. That's part of the title of the paper. And just as a summarize, so to make sure we're all on the same page, um, his description focused on these social impairments in these children. Uh, this is a quote from the paper. These children have come into the world with innate ability to form the, with an innate inability to form the usual biologically provided effective contact with people, just as other children come into the world with innate physical or intellectual handicaps. So he saw this as a new clinical description focused on social deficits. Um, he also knows repetitive behaviors, repetitive interests, insistence on sameness. All of these characteristics are still reflected in the current DSM. If anybody has an interest in autism, I encourage you to read this paper because it's still highly relevant uh, and very well written. Um, it, the first case study that, that uh, Connor focuses on in that paper is a child named Donald Triplett. He's no longer a child. He is still alive and well. I encourage you to Google Donald Triplett Atlantic Monthly. That magazine had a fascinating article about him and, and his life trajectories now in his mid to late 70s. Uh, but in that description of Donald, his atten Connor's attention about his characteristics were first uh, brought to him by Donald's father. So the first clinical descriptions of autism actually predate Connor and some of these parents were providing them. This is a quote about Donald uh, provided by his father. Uh, at one year, Donald could hum and sing many tunes accurately. He very soon knew an inordinate number of pictures in a set of Compton's encyclopedia. He quickly learned the whole alphabet backwards and as well as forwards and to count to 100. But he was not learning to ask questions or answer questions. He seemed to be self-satisfied. He has no apparent affection when petted. He does, I like that word, he, he, he does not notice when anyone comes or goes. He seems to draw into his shell and live within himself. When interfered with, he has temper tantrums during which he is destructive. At two years, he developed a mania for spinning blocks and pans and other round objects. This should sound very familiar to any of you who have worked with children with autism. But in Connor's description of Donald, he references the father himself. And he noted that this 33-page letter that was sent to him by Donald's father was obsessive <laughs> detail. And he described the father as successful, meticulous, hardworking, who takes everything very seriously. When he walks down the street, he is so absorbed in thinking that he sees nothing and nobody and cannot remember anything about the walk. All right. Some of these characteristics might <laughs> sound familiar to you who are in academia and the sciences. Okay. <laughs> um, in that 1943 paper, uh, Connor actually talks about the broad autism phenotype, although it wasn't called that at the time. But he was noting these characteristic personality similarities in family members. In that paper, he writes, for the most part, the parents, grandparents, and collaterals are preoccupied with abstractions of a scientific, literary, or artistic nature and limited in general interest in people. Even some of the happiest marriages are rather cold and formal affairs. Now that word cold, of course, is related to a lot of harmful developments in the field of autism. Um, a lot of people since then have noted that this, these 11 case studies really came from a very selective group. They were all children of parents who worked at Johns Hopkins University with them in medical settings, were scientists, and this might not be entirely representative. The general, he, Connor goes on to make some really sweeping generalizations about the parents. In that paper is the line, there are very few warm-hearted fathers and mothers. And that was the original basis of this harmful idea of refrigerator mother, that autism was somehow a behavioral 
um, response on the child's point, uh, uh, on the child's part, in in response to cold or aloof or distant uh, mothering. Of course, this was kind of an in vogue idea at the time when there was a big emphasis, of course, on environmental determination and, and behaviorism and, and a, minimi a minimization of, uh, of biology. But Connor, in that paper, to his credit, first argued against that, that interpretation. He wrote that the children's aloneness from the beginning of life makes it difficult to attribute the whole picture exclusively to the type of early parental relations. Unfortunately, if you follow his work over the decades, he later embraces it. Uh, there's a 1960 Time Magazine interview with Connor where he has this really, really heartless and harmful quote. Yes, that parents defrost just enough to produce a child. And it really, it really wasn't until the 1970s uh, where that idea of refrigerator motherhood as a cause of autism was thoroughly debunked. Um, there were several twin studies, uh, one famous one by Michael Rudder, that demonstrated uh, that um, identical twins had high rates of uh, autism between them, but, uh, but non-identical twins were not likely to sh uh, have shared the disorder, and it didn't look like it could be a product of, of environmental rearing, that there had to be a strong biological component. Um, Research since Connor, there's been continued interest in this idea of personality characteristics similar to autism uh, in family members. There's a famous paper by a psychiatrist, Leon Eisenberg, who worked with Connor, I believe, um, entitled The Fathers of Autistic Children. And this was just a passage that I thought was <coughs> quite amusing. Uh, fathers tend to be obsessive, detached, perfectionistic to an extreme. They are preoccupied with detailed minutia to the exclusion of concern for overall meaning. <coughs> a number are scientists. They have a capacity for concentration on their own pursuits amidst veritable chaos about them. One father in the midst of a train wreck was discovered by a rescue squad working away at a manuscript while seated in a railroad car tilted 20 degrees from the vertical. Um, so some of you might uh, be familiar with these kind of personality characteristics. But also inherent in that is the advantages that some of these characteristics might afford, especially within certain uh, professions or environments. And a related quote from Hans As uh, Asperger, which I really like, is it seems that for success in science or art, a dash of autism is es essential. That this idea of really focused attention, being able to block out distractors uh, and, and work uh, at, at, in, a, in, the, in an exclusive capacity um, towards one single goal, obviously, in the sciences, can be very, very helpful. Um, okay. So, this brings us to this conceptualization of the broad autism phenotype. All of you know autism is conceptualized as a spectrum, and what that entails, of course, is that there's a range of severity within individuals that have a diagnosis of autism, but it also suggests that that spectrum might extend beyond the threshold for clinical diagnosis and that individuals can have milder, qualitatively similar traits um, that are consistent with autism but don't meet the, the amount or severity to, to warrant a diagnosis. These characteristics might just be normally distributed within the population. Um, about 1% of the population has an ASD diagnosis. About another 1% likely could meet criteria, but of course, a diagnosis is only warranted when somebody's presenting with some kind of social dysfunction, and if somebody has certain characteristics of autism but aren't experiencing dysfunction because they have a supportive environment or whatever, a, a diagnosis might not be warranted. And this kind of visual dis depiction of 100 people, you can see the individual with autism is here in the darkest blue, it's hard to see in, in, in the light here. Um, but then the family members around them might have be on a lighter shade of blue, and that extends into the general population. Okay? And so the idea being that these characteristics might be prevalent in family members, but to a lesser degree. That's what this, the BAP is, the Broad Autism Phenotype. Those who exhibit autism-like traits, but not enough to, in quantity and or quality to meet diagnostic criteria. So what are these traits if they aren't autism per se? Well, a lot of researchers who work in the area try to see them as paralleling or uh, analogous two autism-like features. And of course, the three primary impairments uh, related to autism are the social impairments, communication difficulties, 
and the non-social repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. What, how do those manifest in the broad autism phenotype? Well, one way to conceptualize them, the researcher that I work with um, on, on these issues, Joe Piven at UNC Chapel Hill, who's been studying broad autism phenotype for many decades, has summarized them in these three terms. Aloofness uh, is the parallel for the social deficits. Lacking an interest in or deriving little enjoyment from social interaction. For communication difficulties, the parallel here are pragmatic language abnormalities. A lot of work has been done in that area uh, by Rebecca Landa. Um, difficulties in the social use of language, such as communicating effectively and maintaining fluid reciprocal conversation. And then for the non-social repetitive domain, rigid personality, a resistance to change or exhibit, exhibiting difficulty, adjusting to it when it occurs. Um, an example of that might be uh, a dad's wife replaces his toothbrush without his permission. Right? And he's very upset and agitated by this, and it bothers him for days and days and days. Or another example, and these come out of interviews that Joe Piven has had with the parents, um, where a wife says that her husband gets incredibly anxious if she asks him to deviate from his routine just a bit. Like, on his way to work, do you mind stopping at the post office and mailing this package for me? It's right there, but it causes him a lot of stress and anxiety, and he's really tightly wound around that routine. Okay. So, <laughs> important thing to know before we go further. These back traits are not pathological. This is not a disorder, right? And as I said, they're likely normally distributed throughout the population. In most cases, they're not presumed to be impairing. Um, so this isn't anything that warrants clinical attention, necessarily. So why would we be interested in studying it then? Well, there are lots of reasons. One is because it really informs this idea of the diagnostic threshold. What is or is not pathological? Where do we draw the line? And typically, the line is drawn um, in, in the area of whether somebody is experiencing issues and dysfunction in their daily lives. Uh, another interesting issue is the idea of disaggregating the phenotype. What do I mean by that? Well, autism is defined by those three characteristics. Those three characteristics may exist independent of each other in certain individuals. They weren't, weren't a diagnosis of autism because you have to have those characteristics uh, for it to be autism. But perhaps they can ex occur independently in the broad autism phenotype. That is of a lot of interest to geneticists because what may or may not occur when somebody with one characteristic procreates with somebody with another characteristic, does that increase the risk of autism in the child? These are the kind of questions that our studies have been trying to answer. Um, we're trying to identify traits that may confer vulnerability to, to autism. As you all know, the search for genes related to autism has been very, very difficult to find. And I like this quote, autism is not a wrinkled peak. It's not Mendelian genetics. It's not uh, as, as simple as uh, a dominant and recessive gene. We're likely talking about dozens if not hundreds of genes interacting and responding differently to different certain environmental contexts, prenatal, postnatal. It's incredibly complex. So searching just for quality, uh, transmission between parent and child, both having autism, is a rare thing to find. We might be able to get a lot more leverage at understanding this if we look at these subclinical traits and look at them possibly uh, independent from one another. And in this way, it might be able to guide genetic research. You no doubt have seen in a lot of mainstream coverage of genetics of autism this enormous interest in these de novo mutations uh, that are associated with an increased uh, risk of autism. Higher rates of them are found in older fathers. Um, these are non-biologically transmitted mutations that occur uh, during procreation that are not rated, related to the biology of the parents. Well, in truth, I just mentioned that, uh, those mutations just account for about 3% of the cases of autism. And a recent study um, estimated that over 50%, the majority of cases of autism, are from common variants. And what we mean by that is inherited biological transmissions, okay? Where the BAP is probably most relevant. Now, one of the issues is there really is no standardized criteria for measuring the BAP. There's no standard for diagnosing the BAP, and I use that word loosely. I probably should say classifying, since this is not a disorder. Um, historically, 
Uh, clinical interview methods were used, some developed by Rebecca Language in that pragmatic language domain I talked about, and some by my postdoc mentor, Joe Piven, um, on some of the other characteristics. But what these involved are actual face-to-face -face interviews with, with parents and independent face-to-face -face interviews with a uh, highly knowledgeable informant, usually a spouse. Oftentimes that spouse will reveal <laughs> really important information that either the person themselves do not disclose or they're not aware of those issues themselves, kind of like the toothbrush incident I, mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. Um, it was set up originally to be a categorical classification. You either have this BAP characteristic or you not to mirror the way it is in ASD. Some people are, are thinking about it more in terms of the spectrum now um, because obviously it is related in, in some quantitative way uh, to uh, people uh, on the spectrum itself. So the issue with this though, are these clinical interview methods are really intensive. They require expertise. They take a lot of resources. And lots of people are interested in measuring the VAP, but they don't have this uh, method at their disposal. Uh, lots of geneticists want to get indications of, of uh, VAP characteristics in, in their sample. Um, so what Joe ended up doing is distilling the most informative features of those interviews into a questionnaire uh, called the Broad Autism Phenotype Questionnaire. It has both a self and informant version. The questions are exactly the same on each. There are 36 questions. Each question is rated on a scale of one to six. 12 of those questions are uh, related to one of the three subscales. There's a subscale for aloofness, which I talked about earlier. There's a subscale for pragmatic language, and then there's a subscale for rigidity. So it can separate those characteristics. Perhaps one person will be high on one characteristic, but low on another. Um, the original validation happened in 2007. And they derived these cutoff scores that characterize somebody as having a BAP characteristic or not uh, based on bringing back parents into the lab that they already knew had the, the broad autism phenotype based on their clinical interviews and then finding what the cutoff scores on their self and informant reports most match up to them. Well, that's not a kind of good indication for how these things might be distributed in the, in, in, in the world naturally. So the study that I was involved with about a year or so ago um, was a population-based study. And what this entailed was assessing the psychometric properties of that BAPQ instrument uh, in a more representative community-based sample. So we had 711 parents of a child with ASD, called PCAs here, um, and uh, 981 comparison community parents drawn from the same community but not screened or filtered at all. This could be a smorgasbord of people. There could be people with autism in here. We don't know. It's just we're trying to get a representation of what the BAP looks like in the community. This is in North Carolina, where this sample was drawn from. Um, so our goal here was to establish these cutoff values based upon the distribution of the BAP traits in the general population and to examine whether they occur at higher rates in parents of children with autism. Um, the ultimate goal here is we want to validate the instrument for use for classifying individuals as BAP positive versus BAP negative. Um, so people don't have to use it just as a screening tool to then follow up with clinical interviews, that they can just use this really quick interview, uh, this questionnaire, to get all the information they need. Um, and we could use those cutoff scores to look for pre prevalence rates in mothers and fathers, uh, both in the general population and of parents with uh, a child with autism. Now, this is the psychometric validation. I'm not going to go over this because that's way into the weeds. But we did an exploratory factor analysis on the uh, on 36 items, and it confirms that a three-factor structure is the best. That 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 they correspond to our our predicted subscales. I can just give you a couple in, uh, examples of the items, which may be of interest to you. For example, for aloofness, one of the items is I like being around other people or I would rather talk to people to get information than to socialize. Some of these are reverse forward. Uh, here's an, uh, an item for rigidity. I am comfortable with unexpected changes in my plan, or people have to talk me into trying something new. Um, a pragmatic language abnormality item is I find it hard to get my words out smoothly, or it's hard for me to avoid getting sidetracked in conversations. Okay, so we have psychometric validation for both the self-report version and the informant report version. If you're really interested, I could talk about that sometime. But there is a lot of reliability between uh, items on the subscale. We did a lot of confirmation in that paper about the psychometric property. But 
We also, of course, wanted to examine PCAs compared to uh, CPs, comparison parents. Um, and across the board, for both mothers and fathers, the parents of children with autism had higher scores. Now, these are the average self and informant version scores because we didn't know which one might be more valid than another. Uh, the reason to believe that informant might be across the board, I can tell you, informant report is higher than the self report, and I'm going to get into that issue in a second. But this is just based on the average of the two. Um, parents of the children with autism, both mothers and fathers, scored higher than comparison parents on the aloof personality, pragmatic language, rigidity, and a total score, which is all uh, the average of all 36. We then use the scores here to create new cutoff values for each trait. And what I mean by a cutoff value, again, is whether we're going to classify somebody as being having the characteristics versus not. And based on some prior research, what we did is we looked at the, the distribution of these traits in the general population and had a cutoff at one and a half standard deviations away from that, that mean. Um, we had a small subsample that actually were involved with clinical interviews, so we could try to cross-validate that to the gold standard clinical interview method to see how well those new cutoffs, ca ca uh, cutoffs categorized the parents. Um, in sum, there's a lot of detail in the paper, but the cutoffs, compared to those old cutoffs in 2007, were much higher on specificity. Spec specificity, sorry, that word's always a mouthful. Um, which means, it, they basically eliminate false positives. If you score as bat positive on the, these new cutoff versions, you would be labeled as bat positive in a clinical interview method. Unfortunately, they're a little bit lower on sensitivity, meaning there are people that meet criteria for the BAP in clinical interviews that don't meet it on the questionnaire. You're going to miss some true positives with these. Uh, so these are more stringent cutoff values compared to the 2007 ones. So, in sum, the new cutoffs maximize specificity at the cost of some sensitivity, and so we recommend that people use these cutoffs if they're not going to do any follow-up assessments, and this is it, because if you use this and somebody meets criteria, they are going to meet criteria in the clinical interviews. You're going to get a true back sample by using them. If you have the means to follow up some way, you can use the original ones as a screener, follow up in person, therefore you might be able to get a larger sample that way. Um, but if you just use the old ones, you're likely to get a, a messy sample that has some, some uh, false positives in there. All right. So we use those cutoff values to look at the prevalence of these BAP traits in the general population and in parents of a child with autism. The prevalence right here is just the proportion of parents that uh, cross that cutoff value. And you can see here <laughs> that we have significantly higher prevalence rates in the PCAs compared to the comparison parents across the board. Um, they vary, but comparison parents, the rates of these traits were somewhere between 4 or 5% and 9% of the parents who <laughs> have these traits. And the parents of a child with autism, it was more like 14 to 24, 25%. Okay? And you can see it kind of looks like maybe moms <laughs> uh, are having higher rates than the fathers in these PCAs. A lot of that is the reflection of lower rates on the BAPQ across the board for women than men in the general population. So that, remember, this is all relative to uh, same-sex uh, individuals in the general population. Um, in general, f fathers and men score higher on the BAPQ than women. Um, but this prevalence gap that we're asserting here, and they're all significant differences, might be conservative because, again, we did not control for anything in that community population. We didn't look for, some of them may have had children with autism. We did not screen out. This is supposed to be a reflection of what the general population looks like. Okay, so now this instrument, this BAPQ, because it has these interest, these three separate subscales, we can look at number of features in, in parents. And you can see the majority of parents <laughs> that have a child with autism don't have any BAPQ features. Okay, so we're not talking, this isn't universal, the way Connor kind of <laughs> pitched it, at least how we're measuring it. Um, but BAP traits are more likely, not only at a single level in parents of a child with autism compared to uh, comparison parents, but they're more likely to have multiple features, or even three features. If you have all three features, you might even meet diagnosis for autism. This was Joe's concern that we don't even know, maybe these parents might have autism themselves. <laughs> 
Um, but these parents of child with autism were more likely to have multiple BAP features. But in truth, most parents who had a BAP feature only had one. Right? We're not finding that many parents that have multiple features, which suggests some kind of independence that these traits can exist in, uh, out there in the world. Um, why and how these traits end up co-occurring in autism is a really interesting and difficult question. Why do children with autism present both with these characteristic social deficits and then these particular repetitive behaviors? Right? Some of my work has been interested in trying to figure out how those two uh, characteristics interplay with each other and reinforce each other uh, developmentally over time, some of my studies with children. Um, but it's an open question and, and a very difficult one. Okay, in a follow-up paper, we then started to look at uh, additional aspects of these characteristics within families. First, we were interested in whether parents of children with autism were more likely to have multiple partner, both uh, members of that, uh, of that partnership having BAP characteristics, or was it more likely that only one parent is presenting with these? There's some kind of genetic theories that might emphasize the increased risk of autism when both parents come together. This assortative mating hypothesis it was floated out there with Silicon Valley about 15 years ago. The reason we're seeing so many high rates of autism in Silicon Valley is well, the internet exists now, and these people can find each other when they didn't find each other before, and you have multiple uh, people with, with these characteristics, and it cre increases the risk of autism. But we can look at that with the data we have. Uh, does genetic liability for autism increase when both parents exhibit these features? We could also start to explore intergenerational transmission. Parents of children with autism who have these characteristics, do they have children with autism with more severe symptoms than those that don't? We have a lot of these parents of children with autism that don't have any bad features. How do their children look compared to those that do? So how do bad positive parents of children with autism, do they have kids with more severe autism than those that are bad negative? And do these couples with no bad traits at all have kids with less severe autism? Okay, so let's get to the data here. Are these couples more likely to consist of one or two BAP positive parents? There's a lot to show you here, but this is the number of parents positive on the BAP composite, the, the BAP composite score. You can see 64% of these couples that have a child with autism, neither of them are positive. 31%, 32% have just one, but only 4.3% had both that were positive. We could define this differently. We could say, okay, just on one BAP feature, what are the, what, what are the stats here? Well, 46%, no, neither parent has a single BAP feature. We have about 40% with one of the parents has a BAP feature. And 15% that both parents have at least one BAP feature. Right? And this is on the two BAP But what you can see here, hopefully, is that few of these parental pairs consist of two BAP positive parents. Even though that's more common then compared to <coughs> controls, it's still of the, the minority of these, these parents. Parents of uh, children with autism as couples were much more likely to consist of a single BAP positive parents. So there's not much support here for this idea of bilineal transmission. That means increased risk for the disorder when both parents have related characteristics. That's Depending on how we measure BAP positive, if it's a single trait or the composite or two traits, we can estimate that 36 to 54 percent of the couples have at least one bat positive parent. But not shown here, it was equally likely to be the mother or the father. Um, how about this question of do parents of children with autism who have bat characteristics have children with greater autism symptom severity than those without? There's a lot going on here. This is the table I just took straight out of the, the paper. But we measured symptom severity in the children with the SCQ, a very common instrument. But interestingly, the SCQ has a total score, but it also can separate, like the BAP you can, on social communication and restrictive repetitive symptoms in the child with autism. And so here we have the characteristic of the parents. These are BAP aloof parents. When they are present, this is the, SC, the SCQ score for their child compared when it's absent. And you will notice they have significantly higher scores on the SCQ when the parent is positive for aloofness. 
Now, what became really fascinating is that not only did we see this kind of relationship between characteristics of the parents, but it was trait specific in a way. So, aloof and pragmatic language are both part of social presentation. They're both social characteristics of the BAP. And you can see they relate to the social sense of severity in the child, but they do not relate to the, uh, sorry, to the restricted and repetitive behavior ones. And having a rigid parent personality, but not the others, isn't related, it wasn't very predictive at all. But in terms of this social relationship, the social characteristics of the parent were related to social severity in the kid, but not the non-social characteristics. So this, the findings of intergenerational transmission differed by subscale. The social BAP components were a lot more predictive. Um, they were related to social but not non-social symptoms in the children. The SCQ scores, not shown here, was lowest for the couples with no BAP traits. Right? So if you are a couple and you don't have the BAP in either parent, but you have a child with autism, they tended to have the least severe symptoms. Um, there was no difference, though, in symptom severity for the children of couples with one versus two BAP-positive parents. Okay, Again, suggesting that having two doesn't increase um, severity uh, of, of the child. So what's this take home from this study is that this, the BAP in the parents isn't just related to qualitative, qualitative diagnosis in kids, meaning you're more likely to have a kid with autism. It's also related to the quantitative expression of those symptoms and might show some similarity uh, in type of characteristic from parent to child. Okay, this is the more, most recent study where I got very interested in the accuracy of self-report versus informant report because everything I just showed you was based on self and informant report, based on the average actually of those two because we didn't know which one to trust more without validating it through um, gold standard clinical interview methods. So there, there are these self and informant, re informant report versions. All the previous analysis were based upon the average just in order to minimize bias. But in truth, people who are using the BAPQ, and a lot of people are using it out there in their study, are just using the self-report version. Because it takes a lot of time and resources and effort to find a, a familiar informant to give it to them. They are in a hurry. They just want to get their information about the BAP and get out of there. The BAPQ takes five minutes when you just give it to the participant who's in there already for the study. Maybe it's a genetic study, and you give them this as well. But does just using the self-report version affect the accuracy of their classification. Maybe if you have some of these characteristics, you aren't the best person to assess the presence of those characteristics. Um, so this is where things get really interesting but messy. But from a psychologist interested in measurement, this is a kind of a central central issue. And you don't want people using an instrument without this information available. Um, so generally speaking, how well does self and informant report agree on personality measurement? There's a lot of work in this in the personality field that I became familiar with uh, rapidly, and I spent a lot of time in Rob Ackerman's office asking him questions about these things and learning about these concepts. Um, for typical personality characteristics, agreement between self-report on those and a familiar informant, a spouse, a best friend, uh, a roommate, is moderate, about the correlation of about 0.4. But it goes down even further when we're talking about personality pathology. It's been called modest at best, 0.26. There's not a lot of agreement about how somebody sees their own personality uh, characteristics, especially when they're pathological, and how an informant sees them. Now why? Well, in, in truth, Informant report of pathology is typically higher. They're more likely to endorse that the person has it than the person is to endorse it themselves. Uh, why is that the case? Well, there are lots of reasons. There's lots of evidence that, well, the self-reporter likes to self-enhance. They see themselves better than the informant does. Or the self-reporter doesn't view those traits as negatively as the informant who has to, ex maybe if it's a spouse, experience the brunt of the negative <laughs> aspects of those characteristics. Uh, there may be an informant bias for picking up and noticing, you know, pathological aspects of personality. Perhaps the traits are just simply experienced differently for the self versus the informant. In our studies of 
rigid personality and, and these uh, uh, parents, you know, for a father who's extremely rigid and keeps to his routine, that might not be a negative. That could be a positive. That simplifies my life. It keeps things organized. It relieves my anxiety. I don't have to encounter things that, that cause me frustration. But for somebody living with them who is incredibly inflexible, uh, that could be seen as a problematic issue and cause them a lot of frustration. Okay. Keep that in mind as I show you the results of that rigidity. <laughs> uh, so again, these fat traits are not pathological, but they might be vulnerable to these discrepancies between self-report and informant report. Um, because these characteristics, and some of my prior work on, on the BAP, are related to reduced social cognitive ability and a lower quality social uh, skill as evaluated by, by blind coders. This is based actually on UTD students. We did a study um, looking at those who have high uh, BAP traits versus low BAP traits and how they perform when they're meeting somebody for the first time. We actually videotape them in a social exchange. They get coded later. They do these social cognitive tasks on emotion recognition and theory of mind. Well, they perform lower uh, on those tasks compared to people without those BAP characteristics, but only for this social BAP. Rigidity didn't have any predictive value on social skill. Okay, anyway, that's a different study. Um, so let's look at the data from the agreement between the self and informant uh, report versions of the BAP here. We, this is based on the prior sample, but we found the 444 parents of a child with autism that we had both self and informant data um, from the husband and wife, sometimes ex-wife, uh, but where we had 222 couples. Now this, I wasn't anticipating this, and this kind of blew my mind. If you look at self and informant agreement, just using partial pairwise interclass correlation, the correlation between self and informant uh, report, if the parent is positive for the trait, positive for aloofness, there is no correlation between their ratings of aloofness and the informant's rating. But if they're positive for aloofness, there's correlations. They agree on pragmatic language. They agree on rigidity. Look down at pragmatic language. You get the same thing. You get a negative. It's not a correlation. There's no agreement when somebody is positive on pragmatic language between their self-rating and the informant rating, yet they agree on aloof and rigidity. You look at rigidity. This was a significant negative correlation. I had no way to interpret this. I had no idea. That means the more that the informant was saying this person was rigid, the less the person was saying that they were rigid. It was, it's just crazy. But other than that, if you're not if you're not classified as having that bad characteristic, you agree on aloofness. You agree on pragmatic language, right? It was it blew my mind. Okay, so there was this selective disagreement that was occurring when the self-reporting parent was positive for the assessed trait. In contrast, the status, back status of the informant didn't matter. I'm still working out what this means, but if you do the same analysis, but now the positive aloof is the informant parent, right? They agree with the self-reporting parent on informant, uh, on, on the, the presence of that trait. Okay, we're gonna dig into this a little bit. So what underlies this pattern of selective disagreement between the self, uh, for these positive self-reporters. Well, is it because informants are endorsing the trait more than the self-reporter is endorsing it, or is it vice versa? Well, to look at this, we looked at these discrepancy scores. We subtracted the self-reporter's score on that trait from what the informant gave it to get a single number. So if the number is positive, that means the informant is endorsing it more than the self-reporter. And this is the figure from the paper. Let's just look at aloofness here, okay? Red is fathers and blue is mothers. These are fathers that were positive on aloofness. They're showing a significant discrepancy between self and informant. Informants are calling them more aloof than they're calling themselves. Meanwhile, positive mothers, there's agreement. Right? So these are self-reporting fathers that aren't saying they're as aloof as their wives are saying, telling them. When there's negative, there's no difference between them. So, yeah, yeah, just do the blue one again. So that's the blue one is mothers, mothers. The mothers are positive. These, these are self-reporting mothers who are positive on aloofness. Their informant husbands are rating them on aloofness the same that they're rating themselves. But fathers are underestimating their own aloofness relative to what their informant wives are saying. Okay, 
the same pattern happens for pragmatic language and for rigidity across the board informants, mothers and fathers, are calling their spouse, uh, their positive spouse for rigidity, they're the ones saying that they're rigid. Nobody is admitting to themselves that they're rigid. Okay? Um, and for the total bath, you get the same kind of pattern that you see for a lived pragmatic language, where there's a greater discrepancy that uh, for self-reporting fathers positive on the BAP, they're not endorsing that they have the BAP as much as their wives are endorsing it. So informants are rating BAP positive self-reporting fathers higher than the fathers are rating themselves. And aside from rigidity, that discrepancy didn't occur for BAP positive mothers. All right? So what that is saying is we don't understand the reasons for this gender discrepancy going on but that fathers may not be particularly adept or insightful about recognizing their own BAP characteristics. Okay. I don't know why they are not mothers. Do it with the general population. Of <laughs> I actually have. In my reviews, I was asked to uh, do that. And it is similar. There's some slight discrepancies, but the story is mostly the same. Mm -hmm. It's not in the paper. Okay. <laughs> we then, I was interested, I was like, we, in this prior paper we looked at prevalence rates, but that prevalence rate was based on the average. What would happen if we just used the self-report version to, to determine prevalence, or we just used the informant version? Well, for fathers, because they under-report their own back traits, you get a much higher prevalence rate if you use the informant version than if you use the self-version, especially for that total back. You get a, 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 a difference, uh, a, a, twice the difference, right? That doesn't occur for mothers. The prevalence rate is relatively similar with some uh, slight differences for the self and informant version. That means what you're using to determine prevalence really changes the story here. Prevalence estimates are lower for fathers when derived from self-report relative to informant report. Okay, so let's summarize what this all might mean. Well, okay, so self-report may underestimate the presence of BAP traits in BAP-positive fathers, but not mothers of a child with autism. Now, a cautionary note here, we don't know for sure about that classification status because it was based on the average of the two, so these aren't completely independent analysis. To be sure, we would have to use these objective third-party clinical evaluations to see if the self-report version or the informed report version are, are, are more accurate or valid. Um, but from the data we have already, already, we can't say that the findings we're, that we're seeing are from poor self-reporting by fathers generally because it only occurred when they had that trait. It didn't occur for the other traits, right? And it's not a general tendency of over-reporting by informant mothers. It's not just that women are rating husbands as higher on these things because they agree often when the trait isn't present. So, as I mentioned earlier, that interesting finding of higher informant ratings for rigidity across the board, as I mentioned, it may just be an aspect of personality that informants view more negatively than self-reporters. And we can't really dig into what's going on there, but that's my interpretation. And finally, remember the BAP status of the informant didn't affect agreement. This was only, the far findings were only when the self-reporter had the BAP term. Now this finding is actually a big relief because as many of you know, many autism related assessments like the ADI uh, rely exclusively or in part on parental reporter interview measures. That would have been very problematic if the informant isn't very adept at seeing when they have that traits of seeing these characteristics, that could really skew some of those, those measures. Okay, so let me just wrap up by telling you what's kind of going on now. Well, we have done other BAP studies that I didn't focus on here. As I briefly mentioned, we found that in UTD st students, uh, having aspects of the social BAP was associated with reduced social cognitive ability and reduced social skill. This is still within the normal range. These aren't people that would meet criteria for autism. We have a paper under review now that's actually really fascinating. It's a col collaboration with Rob Ackerman, where he has studied roommate pairs, mostly freshmen, who were unfamiliar with each other prior to rooming together. They were, they were assigned to each other. We got information about back traits prior to them ever living together, and then followed how well they got along with each other over the course of 10 weeks. Um, 
Daniel Faiso is a graduate student, a doctoral student in my lab, and this is, this is his, one of his papers. Um, it's under review now, and what we find is that aloofness as a trait is very predictive of how satisfied the roommates are with each other uh, and how much they depend on each other and interact with each other down the road. Now, it's not an absolute. It's a, when there's a mismatch of aloofness, when one roommate is highly aloof and the other is not aloof, they're outgoing, there is problems. But when they are matched, either they're both aloof, they're both introverts, <laughs> or they are both not introverts, they're, they're outgoing, they don't have any aloofness, you have high satisfaction. So this did not occur for the other traits. There seemed to be something about, and I think it's related to social motivation, somebody who has a lot of social needs wants their roommate to, have so, to, to, to be able to, uh, to feed that need for social interaction. And when you have a mismatch, that can cause some issues. So the roommates that were mismatched on, each, on that didn't like each other very much at the end of the day. Okay. Um, there's some other current and future BAP studies. We are starting to investigate aspects of the non-social BAP. Uh, almost all the work that I've seen on the BAP has been related to social uh, functioning, but I've done work in autism related to restricted interests and hobbies, and we're starting to explore that uh, within this concept of non-social qualities of the BAP. I don't know how much rigidity will capture that, though. Um, my ideal world would be to study the BAP, the BAP prospectively rather than retrospectively. In a lot of ways, the sample we get is a selection bias. These are parents. They have met somebody and have had at least enough of a, uh, of a spark to have a child. <laughs> And we don't know if that is necessarily representative of all people that have BAP characteristics. What about people that don't have children? What are their lives like? Um, I would love to simply give a sample, like the BAP to students leaving UTD, follow them for 10 years, and look at life trajectories based on these personality characteristics. Um, and that's it. This is, uh, these are a lot of my uh, collaborators, both at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, involved in a lot of the studies I talked about here, and the students here at UT Dallas, uh, and my colleagues, Amy and Rob Ackerman, who have helped out on these studies. So, thank you.